actual capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. Let's go ahead and define some things about the parallel plate capacitor. I keep emphasizing this, and it's not because I think you guys are not smart. It's because I want to make sure that we have the same vision for what this is. So remember, this is you know, three-dimensional. These are, and this is a plate, a, you know, something with extension. I'm not going to draw this on the bottom plate, so just get in the way. But you understand what I'm saying, right? They're both the same. And they have an overlapping area. So we're going to say that this side has an area A. And that they are separated by distance D. Now, step one in calculating capacitance. And let me state for the record that what we're doing is trying to get an expression for how the shape and construction of our plates affects the capacitance. That's what we're calculating here. How the shape and construction of our plates creates capacitance. We're going to use the definition of capacitance to get there. In the end, what I'm hoping we have is something that is related to the size and shape of the object, not the charge and potential of the object. We already have this definition for capacitance, which is based on charge and potential difference. I would like to know whether making the plates bigger increases the capacitance. I would like to know whether separating the plates a different distance changes the capacitance. That's what I'm looking for here. What is the relationship between the size of the plates and their separation distance? So when we deal with finding the capacitance for a set of plates, we're talking about the geometry of the system the shape, the size, how you construct it. So we start, step one, by assuming the plates are charged to a value of Q. It's just a random value, but we assume the plates are charged already. Based on that, we expect that an electric field has been established between the two plates, regardless of their shape, size, or configuration, if one of them is positive and one of them is negative, there will now be an electric field established that goes from the positive plate to the negative plate. Our next job is to try and figure out what the potential difference is due to the charge that is established. So step one is to assume that there's a charge. Step two is to calculate potential difference due to the charge. Now, this is a plate, a charged plate. We know that the electric field near a charged plate has a value we can count on. Sigma over 2 epsilon naught. That is the electric field near a thin sheet of charge. Our plate is a thin sheet of charge. And in actuality, there are two sheets of charge. There is a positive sheet of charge, which creates this electric field. And there's a negative plate of charge, which also creates this size electric field. Now, we talked about this once before, but I want to remind you and let's color code this for just a minute. Let's say that the red arrows represent the electric field from the top plate. There would also be red arrows going up as well due to the top plate. And let's say that the green arrows represent the electric field due to the bottom plate. Well, they'd be going towards the bottom plate but I'd be having it on both sides of the plate. If the plates are sufficiently close together, then on the outside of the plates, the red arrows and the green arrows are in opposition, and therefore the electric field outside these plates on the bottom is zero. Also, if we continue that thought, 
above the plates, the electric field is also zero because the electric fields are in opposition. Remember, electric field is uniform near a plate, I'm sorry, near a sheet, so it doesn't decay the further away you get. On the, on the other hand, in between, there are two contributions to the electric field. So the total electric field between the plates is two times the value for one plate, or just sigma over epsilon naught. Now, this might not be a surprise to you, but I don't really, don't really want to have this listed as sigma. I want this in terms of the charge, because that's what we did. We charged the plates. So I hope that it's not a huge deal that I remind you that sigma would have to be the charge divided by the area of the plate. Right? Coulomb per meter squared would have to be the charge density of the plate. So I can actually say that E total is Q over epsilon naught times A. Okay so far? Any questions about that? Okay, now I need the electric field because I want to calculate the change in potential from the top plate to the bottom plate. To calculate the change in potential, I'm going to integrate the electric field from the top plate to the bottom plate. Now, remember, dot product, all that, I'm going from the top plate to the bottom plate, so I'm going to go from zero to a distance d. I'm going to take my expression for the electric field and place it in the integral. I'm going to recognize that I'm moving in the direction of the electric field, so my dot product is just cosine of zero degrees. Integrating from the top plate to the bottom plate is decreasing potential. I expect a negative for my answer. Now, there is nothing here that deals with x. The electric field was uniform. It doesn't decay or get smaller as I get further away from the plate. It stays the same. So all of this can go in front of the integral because none of it has to do with where I am between the plates. So... That's going to give me Q over epsilon naught A integrating dx. Well, there's obviously a, there's an implied one there. So if I want to do this integral, I have to do the antiderivative first. And please... Tell me that I don't have to do too much here to convince you that it's just going to be x. This is right now x to the 0. Add 1 to x, I get just x. Divide by my new exponent, which is 1, and I'm left with x. Evaluated from 0 to d. Remember, I have to put both of my limits in there and subtract them. So this just becomes and d minus zero is just d. So my potential difference between the plates looks like that. So step one was to charge plates. Step two was to find the potential difference between those plates due to the charge. I've done that. So now all that is left for me to do is to apply the definition of capacitance. The definition of capacitance is charge divided by potential difference. 
Now, I strip away the negative sign here because I only care about the capacitance. And that only requires the magnitude of each of these things. So the top has Q. The bottom has QD divided by epsilon naught A. Now, I don't want to leave it like this because there's things that could be canceled out, like the Q. And more importantly, I could also move the epsilon naught times A to the top by multiplying top and bottom of the fraction by epsilon A. What is left, and if you've done this right, you'll know you've done it right if Q cancels out. I'll be really clear. You've done this right if Q cancels out. Also, you've done this right if whatever is left, not including epsilon, has units of length only. That's another way you'll know you've done this right. Two ways to know you've done this right. Q cancels out, and whatever you're left with, not including epsilon, has to be in length only. This is meter squared divided by meters. That's a length. So this is the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. What was the second reason? I didn't say reason. I said condition. condition. That if you remove epsilon naught, your units are just meters. Units of length. Yes, sir? Should they always be just meters? You know you've done this right if when you remove epsilon naught, whatever's left has units of just length. Mm. Okay, be meter squared or that would not be just length. Oh, okay. This is meter squared divided by meters. Our units are just meters. Oh. It could be meters to the fifth divided by meters to the fourth. That would still just be meters. Oh. Do I need another example or am I okay? It could be meters to the 127th divided by meters to the 126th. That'd still be okay. Another example or am I okay? <laughs> so this is the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. Commit it to memory. Commit it to memory. You, you need to. You have to. You have to have it from memory. You're, you're going to have to use it from memory. It's all over the multiple choice part of the test. There's an expectation that We'll talk about doubling the area of the plates or doubling the separation distance, but they don't give you this formula. You have to know that capacitance is a, is a ratio of the area divided by the separation distance. Now, the truth is, these are the only two things that control capacitance for any two pieces of metal. I want to be very clear here. We're going to develop other versions of this, but all capacitors fall in the same kind of, uh, of methodology that Capacitance is driven by two things. The area of the plates and how far apart they are. That's what drives capacitance for any two pieces of metal. I'll say that again because you guys don't write down the things I say unless I write on this, but I'm not going to write this down. The thing that drives all capacitance is how much area of the plates overlap. and how close they are together. The more area that overlaps, the larger the capacitance. The closer they are together, the larger the capacitance. It doesn't always look like this, but that will always be true. That the more the plates overlap, the more area that overlaps, the more capacitance you're going to have. And the closer you get those plates together, the more capacitance you're going to have. We will see other shapes and they do not have the same equation, but they will still be adjustable or they will still be based on that idea. The more area that you have that overlaps, the larger the capacitance. Now, I will point out that epsilon naught refers to the permittivity of free space between the plates. The problem is that we really can never make a vacuum capacitor like this because you can't get the plates close enough for them to actually be a good-sized capacitor if you're going to use a vacuum between the plates. 
It's just too hard to get them close together because getting close, I want you to look at this. You see that the capacitance is truly driven by that separation distance because it's in the denominator. As you reduce the separation distance, you can have huge impacts on the capacitance. So, I mean, I know they're both, they look like they're proportional, but I can have plates that are fundamentally as big as you can probably make and reasonably hold it. Meaning, how, how, how much area do you want? If you want something that you can put in your pocket, it can't have very much area. So it's almost always better to reduce the other variable, make the distance smaller. Because we tend to like to make things smaller, not you know, larger when it comes to this kind of stuff. So we very seldom will have a vacuum between the plates. We'll put something between there instead. So epsilon naught really needs to be epsilon times A over D. Where epsilon represents whatever you put between the plates to hold them apart. Not epsilon naught, but just epsilon. And we're going to talk about what that is, what we would fill this space with uh, tomorrow. All right.